Um, this morning, we're starting a new series that may end up going for most of this year. It's a series that I'll be looking forward to for quite some time, and I'm going to be giving it my very best because I believe it will be incredibly valuable to every single one of us, myself included. If I was to ask you, what is the greatest thing that you can achieve personally during your time on earth and subsequently share with those around you, what would your answer be? Now, I'm sure many of you would be thinking along the lines of loving others and making the world better uh, through the use of your talents and gifts. And they're all wonderful things that make our lives significant. But is there something that trumps everything else that you can achieve for yourself personally and, share, and then share with the people who are in your world? Is there something that actually gives greater meaning to your personal love and talents when it's added into the mix? I believe there is. I believe that the greatest achievement of our lives will be measured by the depth of our personal experience understanding and knowledge of God. I believe to know and understand God is the pinnacle achievement of a human life, of any human life. Our relationship with God gives meaning and purpose to everything that we do. It continually brings change to every area of our lives and has the power to unlock our full potential. Sharing the relationship you have with Jesus is one of the most valuable gifts that you can give to anyone in your world because without an understanding of God and a relationship with Him, our lives have very little meaning. Without God, there is no overarching purpose to our existence and the things we do beyond survival and the minimization of our personal discomfort, be that relationally, uh, physically or emotionally. Now, that doesn't mean that our relationships aren't important to us, but what it does mean is that if God doesn't exist, ultimately none of what we do has any eternal value outside of what we get from it in the present. Now, to give someone the gift of your experience, understanding, and knowledge of God presupposes you have something to give, that you have a relationship with God that you can share with others. Now, when I became a Christian, as many of you would already know, I was in the army at the time, and I vividly remember an experience that I had with one of my mates that sent me on the path that I'm still travelling on to this day. I was on guard duty at Laverick Barracks in North Queensland, Townsville, and I was out on patrol with Steve Fountain, the guy who was in my platoon. Uh, it was early morning, probably around about 2 a.m., and we were walking around our de designated patrol path when he asked me out of the blue to tell him, about God. He was genuinely interested um, in finding out why I had changed so much over the previous uh, months. And I remember being absolutely stumped. I think I said something like, God is really, really good. And, <laughs> and I used really twice in the sentence. And I remember thinking to myself, that sounded incredibly lame. And at that point, the thought gripped my mind that I really do need to develop a relationship with Jesus so that if anybody ever asked me that question again, I would have something that sounded uh, reasonably intelligent to tell them. From that particular moment on, knowing God became a lifelong pursuit of mine. Um, I got out of the army when, I, when my three years of service were up and I went to Bible college for the next two years. When I graduated, I came to Tassie with a, a mate of mine and his wife uh, to plant a church. As part of the church plant, one of my responsibilities was uh, starting up a youth group. And over the next five years, I learned a lot of interesting uh, life lessons. And in the midst of it all, I was able to put into practice something that I had read in the book of Daniel just before I had left Townsville, which became the driving motivation behind everything that I did as a youth pastor 
and continues to and continue to do for Jesus in his church to this day. As I was praying about leaving Townsville and, go, and, and, and going to Tassie, I was reading in the book of Daniel and a scripture just jumped out of the page and I had a revelation that has stuck with me to this day. Daniel 11.32. I used to always say 11.32b because I thought it sounded intelligent. Um, and it was the second part of this verse that really impacted me. Those who do wickedly against the covenant, he shall corrupt with flattery. But the people who know their God shall be strong and carry out great exploits. Now, when I read that sentence, I decided from that day onward that the most important thing that I could do in leadership in the church, in any role that I had in the church, was to encourage people to grow in their relationship with Jesus. I figured that if I could do that consistently, then everything else would take care of itself. Now, why did I think that? Because there was a very clear promise given to those, or given to those Daniel was talking about here in this particular scripture. Who were the ones who were qualified to receive the promise? The people who knew their God. What was the promise? That they would be strong and do great exploits. Now, that might sound a little simplistic, but my experience in the church has proven it to be true over and over again. I'm now 33 years down the track. I know you probably don't believe me when I say that, but I'm 33 years further down the track than I was when I first read that passage of Scripture in Daniel, and I still haven't come across anything that contradicts it. The greatest indicator that a person will go the distance in their walk with God is how real their personal relationship with Jesus is. There's a wonderful, hopeful promise in Jeremiah from God to all of us that I'd like us to write on our hearts this morning, or at least in your phones if you've got them, um, as we start, as we kick off this series. And it's found in Jeremiah 29, verses 13 to 14. Are you all taking notes? Some of you are. That's fantastic. Now, where is it? Here it is. Don't just depend on your memory. Write some notes as well. <laughs> Jeremiah 29, 13 to 14. If you look for me wholeheartedly, you will find me. I will be found by you, says the Lord. An incredible promise by God given to us right back in the Old Testament. That if we look for him wholeheartedly, we will find him. Now some people look at that and go, does that mean that God is hiding? That God's making it difficult for us to find him? I don't believe that's the truth at all. I think what, what it actually means is that we live in a world that is full of distractions. When I was uh, a younger man, um, I used to lead worship with a guitar. And I remember one time at a family camp, um, I had been given the, the privilege of leading worship. And uh, as I was preparing my heart, I was thinking, I really hope tonight that we can break through into the presence of God. And I felt the Holy Spirit speak to me and say, Dermot, it's not a case of you breaking through into my presence because the door's wide open. It's actually a case of you breaking free of all the things that distract you. And why did God have to say, and, and you know, we think that it's, it, we get more distracted today than we did back in the past. Old people will tell you that, that you're more distracted today than you were in the past. That's not true. Because back in the time of Jeremiah, it was just as easy for them to lose sight of God as it is for us today. But God gives us this wonderful promise that cuts through all of the distraction. He says, if you look for me wholeheartedly, you will find me. I will be found by you. You need to engage your whole heart. Because the distractions in this world will try and hide uh, God from you, will try and drown out his voice. There are three ways that you can find out more about God and grow your relationship with him. Number one, your personal experience with the Holy Spirit. Number two, the teaching and example of others. And number three, increasing your knowledge of what's written in the Bible about God and his interaction with his people down through the ages. Now, I can help you with two of those, but the first one, that's all yours. To that end, over the next few months, or next however months it takes us, We'll be taking a journey through the Bible, seeking to find God in the writings that have been left for us. By the time we finish, you will know far more about God 
as he has revealed himself in the pages of the Bible than you do now. And you will have a better understanding of what's truly important to God. Because if you want to get to know someone, you really need to know what's important to them. You'll also gain an overarching understanding of God's actions in the world historically, which will then help you have a greater appreciation and understanding of God's actions in the present, in our present world. I'm hoping and praying that, that we learn together, that what we learn together will encourage you to seek a deeper relationship with Jesus so that your personal experience of God will match what you're learning through this series. It's my hope that if you ever get asked by someone to tell them about God, that you'll have a much richer store of experience and knowledge to draw from. Just as importantly, I'm also believing that the pursuit of God will change you for the better. And you'll experience for yourself firsthand what Daniel prophesied, that you would be strong in the face of challenges and that you would carry out great exploits, whatever that might look like. But today I want, to, I want you to prepare your heart for the journey ahead. The reason that I've used Where's God uh, as the title of this series and appear to have taken straight from a much loved series of books uh, called Where's Wally wasn't just, or wasn't, there's no just involved in this at all, wasn't because I thought it was a good gimmick to grab your attention. And I most certainly didn't want to in any way, shape or form make light of our relationship with God, but rather right from the start. I want us to be as brutally honest with ourselves as possible and realise that there will be challenges that we'll have to overcome if we choose to pursue God with everything we have. Now I've dedicated my life to being a pastor, but I'm not an idiot. <laughs> not that pastors are idiots, but sometimes people think that pastors live in an ivory tower, separated from all the ills that beset us on every side out in the community. Finding God and remaining close to him all the days of your life is one of the most challenging things you'll ever do. And it's becoming more and more confusing because the distractions around us seem to be coming louder and louder. Now, there are not greater distractions necessarily than, the, than what we experienced in the past, but the noise level is definitely higher than anything I've experienced in my 21 years of life. Now, when you look out over our world, I mean, when you turn on your TV, well, most of you probably don't get your news from the TV anymore, do you? you get it online. But when you look, when you, when you read the news, when you see the YouTube clips, when you see what the world is devolving into, at a time when the world thinks it's more mature and more civilised than ever, there are more wars happening, there, are, there, there is more bad... Um, feeling being expressed through our media, at politicians, at the, the, the other person down the street. I mean, I have never seen so much angst being displayed in our community as, I, as we're seeing now. Now that might mean, that I'm not necessarily saying that that angst wasn't there all the time, but it's been given a voice that it never had in the past. And in the midst of all of that, finding God can be quite difficult. Hence my picture. Anybody able to figure out where God is on, that, on the screen there? I, found it, I, I knew you would. I, 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 actually knew it. I thought you would call out and say, I found God. God's on the left hand side of the screen over there, making snakes out of clay. All right. <laughs> but finding God can be. Finding God can be very, very difficult, but it's not impossible. And when you do find him, you'll wonder why you missed him in the first place, because his presence will become so much more obvious to you. 
Now, I don't want to be an alarmist because I believe that in times of great trial, uh, there are also opportunities for greater exploits. But if you're not prepared to face what's happening around you, you can end up shipwrecked. And that's the last place that the leadership of grace wants to see any of you, um, or the last thing that the leadership of grace wants to see any of you experiencing. Now, when going, going on a journey, there are preparations you need to make before setting off. Obviously, you can make pit stops along the way to grab things that you've forgotten. And for some of you here today who are already well down the road in your relationship with God, you might find that making a pit stop this morning will be quite helpful. So whether you feel like you're just starting out or you've been on the road for a while, I guarantee that the next few scriptures that I share with you will be very profitable. The first one is found in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 19. And the writer of Hebrews says, Work at living in peace with everyone and work at living a holy life. For those who are not holy will not see the Lord. Now we could flip that and say, put it, and he should have written like this actually. And say, those who are holy will see the Lord. Now that truth that the writer of Hebrews is expressing there was taken directly from the words of Jesus that he shared with his disciples in a famous message of his, which we now call the Sermon on the Mount. In Matthew 5, 8, God blesses those whose hearts are pure, for they will see God. I love how the Passion Translation puts it. What bliss you experience when your heart is pure. Now that could also be translated when your heart is full of innocence. For those, for then your eyes will open to see more and more of God. Now the Aramaic word used for see is nazon and can be translated either in the present tense, they see God, or in the future tense, they will see God. Now the Greek is they will progressively see God. God. So people who have pure hearts will progressively see God over their lives. Now this idea of holiness or purity or innocence being a prerequisite to seeing God is found all the way through the Bible. In Psalm 17, 15, As for me, because I am innocent, I will see your face until I see you for who you really are. I will be satisfied in an awakening of your likeness in me. David asks a question. In Psalm 24, and then answers it for us. Who may climb the mountain of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? Only those whose hands and hearts are pure, who do not worship idols and never tell lies. They will receive the Lord's blessing and have a right relationship with God their Saviour. Such people may seek you and worship in your presence, O God of Jacob. Do you want to know God? Do you want to see God? If you do, then you need to prepare your heart. How innocent is your heart? How pure is your heart? How pure are your intentions? When the lights go out and nobody's looking, where does your heart take you? Now, I'm not saying that to make you feel bad. But what I am saying is that you need to address the, the, the state and the condition of your heart constantly and to keep watch over it. See, it's no use getting upset with God because you can't find him when you're willfully doing things that are harmful to you and to others. When you're in, indulging in personal sin that you're hiding away. When you're gossiping about your friends behind their back or telling lies to your boss to get a leg up at work. So the first thing you have to do is examine your heart and see if there's anything that you're currently doing that you wouldn't be happy showing to Jesus. And it may not just be something that you're doing externally. It might be something that you are contemplating internally. It might be where your mind goes, your imagination goes, that you know that if God was to put it on a screen... Here at church on a Sunday, you'd be incredibly embarrassed. It might be some of the conversations that you're having in your head with other people. I actually find that at my age, I'm pretty good at reading a room and being what people need me to be. The challenge for me is the conversations that I have in my head about those people afterwards. <laughs> 
and what I should have said and what I would have said if I had it all over again. And sometimes those conversations, now, sometimes they are helpful, but the majority of the time they're not. And so that's the area that I find that I'm constantly having to deal with. My attitude, my um, impatience with stupidity, <laughs> mine included, uh, it's what's going on inside my head. And maybe, this, maybe today, people might look at you and go, wow, you seem to be pretty good in the way you treat others. But you know that deep down inside of you, there are th certain things that are going on that you wouldn't want on a screen here at church on a Sunday. And maybe that's the reason that you're struggling to find God, to see God. Not that God is hiding himself away from you. But what happens when you hide those type of things in your heart is that they push you away from God. Walk into a room, dark room, turn the light on. What happens to the darkness? It disappears. Please. It's gone. The light shines. There's no darkness. If we harbour darkness in our hearts, now every one of us does to a certain degree, and we're constantly working on that, but if we are indulging in darkness in our hearts, we will flee when light comes close. So when God wants to make himself obvious to you, you may not be able to see that because of what's going on in your heart and how it clouds what God wants you to see. The last time I preached, I talked about forgiveness. Forgiveness is available to all of us. The issue isn't, can God cleanse your heart? The issue is, do you want your heart cleansed? Do you want to see God? Do you want to know God? Or do you want to continue to limp through life, thinking that he's there, maybe he's there, hoping that he's there, but not really knowing that he is there? In Psalm 51 verse 10, David prays a prayer that we're all going to pray out loud together this morning. It was the prayer that David prayed after the prophet Nathan had uncovered his sin of adultery with Bathsheba and the murder of her husband. David was in a very, very bad place and God met him there. Why? Because he was finally ready to face up to what he had done and seek God's help and forgiveness. David didn't deny the accusation of Nathan. Instead, he repented with everything that he had. I've always wondered what would have happened if Adam and Eve had run to God and uh, hadn't hidden from him when they sinned in the garden. We'll never know, but the Bible tells us over and over again that when men and women throw themselves on the mercy of God, they always find his love, acceptance, and forgiveness. Do you want to know God? Do you want to see God at work in the world around you? Do you want to grow in your relationship with him? Do you want to be able to discern the path he wants you to walk? Do you want to walk with him all the days of your life? If you do, then the state of your heart is the starting point to unlocking every one of the things that I just mentioned. Here's David's prayer. Create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a loyal spirit within me. Do not banish me from your presence and don't take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and make me willing to obey you. David realised something. Now David, when you read his life story, he started off amazingly well. He was chosen, he was the youngest of eight brothers and he was chosen by the prophet Samuel to be the next king of Israel. When everybody else overlooked him, 
God didn't because there was something special about David. He was a shepherd and he was a pretty good one. He was able to defeat bears and lions um, in his protection of the sheep. And he also used to write songs to God. He was a worshipper. God, through the prophet Samuel, says that David is going to be the next king. It's pretty cool when you're a young guy to have a, an incredible word prophesied over your life. And David hid that away in his heart, continued to serve God. And then through the way things worked out, uh, managed to hit the, the, uh, the world stage in a spectacular fashion. He single-handedly with a sling killed a champion of the Philistines who were at that time besieging Israel. And everybody thought David was fantastic. They thought he was wonderful. Saul promised him uh, the hand of his daughter in marriage. And, it was, and, his, and he became quite um, well known throughout Israel. But then Saul started to get a little bit jealous. Um, chases after David to kill him. And David flees the country. Doesn't leave God during that whole time. Continues to, to walk with God. And in the process, God then, um, uh, Saul gets taken out. And David returns in triumph and becomes the king of Israel. David starts to do some incredible things. Um, amazing. Amazing life. Amazing walk with God up until that point. And then some terrible things happened. And David fell, I would, I would imagine, further than anybody here has ever fallen in their lives. Committed adultery um, and then had the woman's husband murdered so that he could then take her as one of his wives. It wasn't like he didn't have a lot of wives. David had multiple wives and concubines, as they had back in those days as a king. But he stepped out of the lane that he had been in. And here's a guy who had been commended by God all the way through, had walked with God, had seen God do incredible things in and through his life, had seen God deliver him from some really tough situations and then walked out of his lane and did what he did. So David understood that without God's help, there was within him something that could take him completely out of the picture, completely side rail his life. And so he prayed that prayer. And the end of it there, it says, and make me willing to obey you. So even David struggled with wanting to obey God. Even David struggled in the, in the path that he was walking on. Where are you going, honey? <laughs> <laughs> See you later. <laughs> and even I need to repent, right? <laughs> See, we do it all the time, don't we? We do stuff. But not perfect. None of us are. Every single one of us needs God's help. And this morning we're going to pray this prayer. If I could have the music back, that would be fantastic. What we're going to do is we're going to pray this prayer. We're, I'm going to get you all to stand in just a moment. We're going to read these words on the screen. And I want you to pray them from your heart today. Because I believe that if we are to see great exploits happen here in Clarence Plains, if we are to see great exploits happen in our families, in our workplaces, here in Tasmania, then the key isn't how well we market the church. The key isn't how well we do things. The key is, and has always been, the depth of our personal relationship with Jesus. The people who know their God shall be strong and do exploits. So we need to deal with anything that is making it more difficult for us to know Him. And it's not the world out there. Whilst that can be a bit confusing at times and that can be a bit loud, the biggest issue that we all face is what's going on inside our hearts. It's the state of our hearts. Which is why we're going to pray this prayer together and ask Jesus to do a work inside of us 
and continue to ask him to do that work in the days and the weeks and the months that lie ahead. As I said,